All right, so this lecture, we're going to look at some of the functioning of the heart. We looked at how the heart beats, um, the cycle of blood rolling through the heart, and now we're going to look at some of the properties or functions of it. And we're looking at cardiac output. Cardiac output is going to be how much blood is pumped out of the heart per minute. And we're going to see this is going to be one of those factors that affects blood flow throughout the body. And it also is going to be one of the factors that affect blood pressure. So we'll look at cardiac output and its properties, then blood flow, and then we'll look at how blood pressure is regulated. This is going to be one of those lectures where there's going to be a lot of integration because we're going to see moving parts. One thing changes, we're going to have to have other things change to make sure we kind of maintain our blood pressure in this homeostatic range. All right. So this is one of those where you kind of have to get the concepts more than just straight memorization or and so you have to think these problems through all right but let's begin with our cardiac output again that is going to be how much blood is pumped out of the heart out of that left ventricle into the systematic circulation for every minute right and our equation for this is one Part of it is one we touched on. We looked at stroke volume. So stroke volume is how much blood and what volume, how many milliliters of blood is pumped out of that left ventricle per every beat of the heart. Okay, so this gives you volume times that by heart rate how many beats so we're going to cancel beats out and ultimately our cardiac output is going to be milliliters per minute so what volume of blood is pumped out of the heart per minute on average say we're at 70 beats per minute all right and we're at 80 milliliters or somewhere close to there, that would get us at 5,600 milliliters per minute. Let's just say 55, but average cardiac output is about 55 milliliters per minute. And we have to maintain this. This is basically almost the minimum in keeping the tissues supplied with oxygen, keep them supplied with nutrients, be able to remove the waste and so forth. So we have to maintain this cardiac output. Okay, this is your average cardiac output at rest. You can imagine this is going to change when we get into exercise. When we get into exercise, we got to supply those muscles very quickly with nutrients, bringing that blood there more quickly. So this is your average at, say, rest. Okay, we're going to see this factor is going to change, and we can see how we can change this. How can we change this cardiac output? Well, we have two factors. We can affect stroke volume, or we can affect heart rate, or we can do both to increase it dramatically. All right, so this is what we're going to first look at is how this cardiac output is regulated. Here's what I was alluding to on the previous slide. You can see our cardiac output, our cardiac output at rest. Here they got 5.8 liters. We said 5.5 liters, roughly. And, you know, this depends on size of the individual, how active the individual, and so forth. And you can see where the blood gets shunted to, right, percentage-wise. When we start exercising, we say we got to supply those muscles. So we're moving up to 25.6 liters per minute. So we've almost, what? Four times the amount of blood is being pumped out per minute. And where is most of that going while we're exercising? You can see it went from 21% to 88% and a much greater. So we're, most of the blood is going to the skeletal muscles. And you can see the percentage of blood going to the internal organs, the skin and so forth gets dropped dramatically. The one thing you will notice is if we calculate it out to the brain, you can see it is kept at a fairly constant. That brain must get its share 
of blood to it, so we keep that at a constant, even though it's dropping to 3%, it's 3% of a much more greater cardiac output. But you can see the changes taking place when we go from rest to exercise. And so how do we get here? How do we get to that higher? Again, we got those two factors. We got stroke volume and we have heart rate that we can modify to get us up to this greater value. Here is basically how we regulate that cardiac output. This part we've already looked at. We looked at the autorhythmic cells. Remember the autorhythmic cells are controlled by the parasympathetic or the sympathetic nervous system. And that's going to control the rate of depolarization from the autorhythmic cells. And that's going to control the heart rate. You see when we exercise, what happens? Sympathetic comes on board and we get increased depolarization. And so we get an increased rate of those autorhythmic cells. Now stroke volume. Stroke volume has several factors that are going to help control what's going to, how much blood is being pumped out per beat. All right. This is every time the ventricle pump contracts. How much blood is being pushed out all right and that can be changed by we can it's determined by the force of contraction how forceful the myocardium is contracting we can see the sympathetic has some effect on contractility you remember the sympathetic innervates the cardiac muscle it can increase the contractility so the forcefulness of the beating we will also see that in diastolic volume, EDV, how much blood is in the heart before, or in the ventricle before it contracts. And we're going to see as EDV goes up and diastolic volume goes up, also will the contractility, the force that the ventricles, and we'll get into what takes place to make that happen. Okay, so we're going to look at these factors in controlling this cardiac output. So our first factor we can change for cardiac output is that heart rate. And what are we regulating? We're regulating those autorhythmic cells. Okay, this should look familiar from our previous lecture in the sympathetic with our norepinephrine or our parasympathetic with our acetylcholine receptors. So we have beta-1 receptors on our autorhythmic cells. And what are they going to do? They are going to increase the sodium and the calcium influx. You remember our pacemaker potential lines up like this. But if we increase sodium and, or sodium and calcium, boom, we can get it up to threshold. Okay, that's threshold much quicker. Right, so the rate of depolarization is much faster, and that's going to increase the heart rate. Increasing the heart rate increases as long as if stroke volume stays the same, we increase the cardiac output. Okay, our parasympathetic, we got our muscarinic receptor, and activation of those muscarinic receptors by acetylcholine are going to increase the potassium efflux. Right, so that's working against the depolarization and we're decreasing calcium influx. So that also is working against depolarization. So instead of this here, this may be even drawn out even longer to get to threshold. Okay, and so that's going to slow down and hyperpolarize the cell and decrease the rate of polarization. If my stroke volume stays the same but my heart rate goes down then my cardiac output also goes down okay so this is how we get this increase or decrease in heart rate okay remember these autorhythmic cells though do not autorhythmic cells spontaneously depolarize they don't have to have 
this input by the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system. But without the parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system talking to them, we can't get these changes in the heart rate, and therefore then we wouldn't be able to control or regulate cardiac output. All right, so there's that slide we've seen before with the autorhythmic cells. There's our pacemaker potential, sodium and potassium. All right, and there's how we regulate. Okay, with increase in sodium and calcium influx, we're able to get the threshold quicker than what we did normally in the cell. And then with increased potassium efflux and decreased calcium, you can see it takes a much more drawn out effect than what we see in the normal. And therefore, okay. and this is called chronotropic effect. Chronotropic meaning the timing of the heart, the timing of the beat, chrono time. A, the Sympathetic has a positive chronotropic effect. It is increasing timing, whereas the parasympathetic has a negative chronotropic effect. It's decreasing the timing or the rate of the heart. Okay. So this chart shows the effects of the sympathetic and parasympathetic on the heart you can see the sa node and the av node the sympathetic is going to have an increased rate an increased conduction rate through the av node whereas the parasympathetic has a decreased rate of depolarization of those autorhythmic cells and that's going to decrease the conduction rate to overall slow the heartbeat what we're going to see next is that controls heart rate. What other factor controls our cardiac output is our strength of contraction, right? Our autonomics also has an effect on the strength of the heart rate in that it increases the sympathetic only in this case. You can see the parasympathetic doesn't have an effect on the contractility, the strength in which the atrium and the ventricles contract, but you can see the sympathetic will increase strength of contraction of the atrial muscles and increase the strength of contraction of the ventricular muscles. Okay, so we'll see besides having an effect on heart rate, the sympathetic will also have an effect on stroke volume because it is affecting the contractility of the heart, how forceful. Less forceful, boom, more forceful when the sympathetic is on board. So here's where we get into stroke volume. We have already seen the sympathetic innervation and epinephrine affect the contractility, the force. All right, we're going to see it also has an effect on venous return, which will have an effect on in diastolic volume, which has an effect on how forceful, and then we'll also see how peripheral resistance plays in this force of contraction to affect contractility. All right, so we're going to go through all these factors. You can see we got a bit more to go through here to get us to the forces that help control contractility of the ventricle and therefore affect the stroke volume. So here is those factors that are going to help control the stroke volume. All right, and again, stroke volume is related to how forceful the contraction is. The more forceful the contraction, the more we're going to be able to push out blood. And one of those factors that controls it is called EDV, endostolic volume. How much blood is in the ventricle before it goes to contract? And this is also what we call the preload. 
volume of blood in the ventricles at the end of diastolic. And preload meaning loading up the ventricle. And what we're going to see is if the ventricle is stretched more, it contracts more forcefully. So less stress, less contractility, less force, more stretch, okay, more contractility. So the preload or increase EDV increases the strength. So we'll push out more blood. We're pushing out more blood. We're increasing the stroke volume and therefore can increase the cardiac output. Another factor that will affect how much blood's pushed out is how much resistance there is. How much resistance is outside the heart? And we're going to see resistance comes from constriction and dilation of the blood vessels outside what the heart is pumping into. If there's more resistance, there's going to be less, there's more force against the heart pushing blood out. The heart will be able to push less blood out and therefore the stroke volume would be decreased. So that is called the resistance on the left ventricle. That is called the afterload. Okay, it's related to the ESV and you can see with increased afterload, we have a decrease in stroke volume. Okay. The other factor, the contractility, the strength of contraction. We saw with our, our, um, uh, with our sympathetic increases contractility. If I increase the contractility, this is called an ionotropic effect, not chronotropic. Chronotropic was heart rate. Positive ionotropic effect will increase the contractility. And if I increase the contractility, I increase the stroke volume. Okay, you may see another term out there too called the ejection fraction. And this is how much of the EDV, how much of that blood that was in the heart before or in the ventricle before it contracted, what percentage is pumped out. Okay, you can see the total peripheral resistance would decrease the ejection fraction, where if we increase contractility, likely it will increase the ejection fraction. Okay, so let's look at these values and how in more detail on how they regulate and affect the stroke volume. We already one factor called the Frank Starling law is going to be a factor in affecting the stroke volume. And this relates to that in diastolic volume. And that stroke volume is proportional to in diastolic. They are directly related. If end diastolic goes up, so does stroke volume, okay, because the contractility is going to increase, right? And this has to do with that length force relationship. Remember, our cardiac muscles have sarcomeres. And if you remember, there was an ideal length in which the sarcomeres, we would get the most forceful contraction, right? There's a length where we get the maximum amount of ability to cross bridge, all right, that configuration of the sarcomere, the maximum ability to uh, cross bridge allows us the greatest force. And what we're going to see when the heart, when there's less blood in the heart, all right, the sarcomeres aren't as stretched, there's less stretch on the heart. And where is our heart going to sit? Or our sarcomeres? You can see in A, I'm getting my big head out of here. In A, when there's very little blood, okay, there's less stretch, less ability for myosin and actin to cross bridge, so there's going to be less force. But as I fill the ventricle up with more and more blood, What's that going to do? It's going to increase the stretch. All right. And as I stretch, you can see the sarcomere is getting into, all right, a better and better configuration. Whereas D, I have all this nice overlap and I'm going to have this ability, maximum ability to cross bridge here. And 
what happens to my force? I'm able to create greater force. Okay, so this has to do with that length tension relationship. This is intrinsic control of the contractility of the muscle. This is inherent in the muscle. Okay, when the muscle is slack, we get less force. We're down in this range. But as the ventricles fill, it puts more and more stretch, and now our sarcomeres get in a much more efficient okay, configuration, allowing us to create more force. Along with this length tension relationship, the stretch on the myocardium also remarked, results in more release of calcium. And we saw that with our skeletal muscle, when we shocked it multiple times, we released more calcium. In this case, the stretch is just causing this increased release in calcium. And what happens when I have more calcium? If I have more calcium, I have more actin molecules, I have more tropomyosin moved, and I have more myosin heads that can bind to actin. And if I have the more ability to cross bridge, I'm gonna have ability to create more force. So the stretch causes both the sarcomere to get into optimal length and it also causes more release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and therefore I can get boom greater force of contraction. Okay this is intrinsic control. There's not an outside force doing it. This is just part of the muscles characteristic okay. now an extrinsic, extrinsic control and outside force is right our epinephrine we get from our sympathetic or from our adrenal medulla all that epinephrine released you can see without our epinephrine at lower at, to create this greater force we have to be at a greater length so we have to have more stretch to get this force if epinephrine is not on board. But look what happens when epinephrine is on board. Where it can my length of my muscle be? It can be much shorter, and I'm able to create the same amount of force up here at less stretch on the muscle. Okay, that epinephrine, what's it do? It increases the strength of contraction by increasing the amount of calcium available. Again, amount of calcium, more ability, more actin myosin interaction, and therefore I can create greater force. Okay, but this is epinephrine. This is an outside force having this effect on the cardiac muscle. Whereas the intrinsic, it's an intrinsic force, it's inside the muscle, factor inside the muscle that is controlling whether we're getting contraction, greater contractility or not. So now let's look on venous return and its effects on stroke volume. So if we return more blood to the heart, you can imagine we can fill the heart more and we can stretch it more. So therefore venous return has an effect on the ES or EDV, the stretch on the heart, and therefore can affect the contractility of it. Okay, so there's that factor, EDV. One of the factors controlling EDV is venous return. So let's look at the factors that affect venous return. Okay, one of those is blood volume, negative inner thoracic pressure, that's your respiratory pump, and venous pressure. Okay, vasoconstriction and our skeletal muscle pump. Remember our vein, when we were talking about our venous system, our veins, we had that respiratory pump and the skeletal muscle pump help in returning blood to the heart, venous pressure. And okay, so if we increase these, all right, we increase blood volume. If there's more blood, there's going to be more venous return and therefore more EDV. If we increase the negative inner thoracic pressure, right, our breathing, we create that low environment, 
All right, we create that low pressure environment in the thoracic cage that will help return more blood to the heart and therefore increase in negative thoracic, inner thoracic pressure will increase venous return and therefore increase in diastolic volume and cause greater contractility. And then finally, venous pressure that comes from the skeletal muscle plug as long as also with the venous constriction the sympathetic can put on will increase venous pressure venous return and again edv and increase the contractility and if we increase edv we increase the contractility of the heart so that's how venous is going to affect it. blood volume you see we maintain our blood volume we're going to see blood volume also comes in regulating our blood pressure this is regulated hormonally so it's not as a quick response it is a more drawn out effect because it is hormonally regulated okay and we're going to see the kidneys are going to be a big player in this regulation of blood volume and we'll get into this more when we get into blood pressure and we'll definitely be getting into this when we get into the kidneys and into the urinary system okay because we can change the amount of reabsorption of water if we reabsorb more water we have larger blood volume and that in turn will affect the venous return and in turn affect the edv and affect the contractility and you see how this is all integrated involved but for our case right here just realize that increased blood volume increases the venous return therefore increases the EDV and there is kind of a review of what we've seen with our veins we saw the respiratory pump creating that inner thoracic environment here low pressure if we increase the volume of the thoracic cage there's lower pressure in there and that will help bring the blood back to the heart and affect that venous return and therefore affect the EDV and the stretch on the heart. Same with the skeletal muscle pump. Okay, skeletal muscle pump. We're active, moving more blood with the skeletal muscles, pushing them past those valves. We're going to have increased venous return and again increasing the stretch on the heart to increase the contractility. So that is how that venous return is going to affect our stroke volume all right so we've seen the factors that have control cardiac output our stroke volume and our heart rate all right now let's listen or look not listen let's look at factors that affect the flow of blood through a vessel okay and this brings up what we call Poussier's law and blood flow is going to be equal to Basically, these four factors are going to come into play. This delta P. This delta P here is the difference in pressure at the beginning of the vessel to the end of the vessel. And you can see if we increase the pressure, the difference in pressure between the two, we're going to increase the flow of blood. The rate is going to increase. The other factor, the little r here, that is the radius of the vessel, whether it's dilated or constricted, right? Dilated meaning R is bigger, bigger dilated vessel will increase the flow. The real takeaway here is this factor is exponential to the fourth, All right? So what we can do, what we see here is the flow of blood is gonna be greatly controlled by the radius of the blood vessel because it is exponential I change this by a factor of two and I actually change the flow of blood by a factor of eight right two to the fourth power I'm sorry I actually change it to bad math here change it to 16 times the flow of blood will be the flow will be 16 times greater where if I change the pressure, the difference in pressure by two, it only changes the flow by double, by two. 
Okay, because this is exponential, I change. Hey, I have a constricted vessel. I double the size of that vessel. I'm going to have the flow of blood is going to be 16 times greater. Okay, so the flow is greatly influenced by the radius of the vessel. Other factors that are going to decrease if we increase them are the viscosity of the blood. If the blood becomes more sicky, say you dehydrated, your blood will become more viscous, all right, less watery like, less fluid like, more sticky, and that would affect the flow. It would slow down the flow. Also, the length of the vessel slows down. The longer the vessel, the slower the flow. Okay, but we don't change vessel lengths too greatly. Um, we can change viscosity a bit, but usually that's in the case of de dehydration or so forth. We can increase, change the pressure, the difference in pressure by how contract, how forceful the heart's pushing out blood. But where we really control the flow of vessel is by controlling what is the radius of the vessel. We can change this greatly exponentially by changing the vessel radius or the vessel diameter. Okay. You see the typical flow of blood. We run it parallel. Typically, our we run from the arteries, right, into a capillary bed, and then capillary bed into the venous and back to the heart. We've seen several cases where we've seen what have we seen? We've seen these portal systems. The kidneys have a portal system, and where there are two. Capillary beds in series. Okay, but typically most tissues, the blood runs into the capillary bed and then out to the venules. We're in a portal system, we get a capillary bed, runs to another capillary bed, and then finally to the venous system. Let's look at our pressure across these vessels, across the flow. We can see Total cross sectional area. Even though the aorta is very big, there's only one aorta. Okay, and you can see the cross sectional area is small in the aorta. And the arteries, cross sectional area, again, there's bigger arteries, but there's less of them, there's, so there's not as much area. And now we're getting into arterioles, where there's a great amount of arterioles. They are smaller, but there's a ton more in the body, and therefore the cross-sectional area goes up. But where we really see this great total cross-sectional area is where we're at the capillaries. Capillaries, there's all these little capillary beds. Okay, they are very small, stature, but there is a ton of them throughout the body, and therefore there is a large amount of cross-sectional area throughout the body for capillaries. Why I'm going here on this cross-sectional area is that a venous goes in the opposite direction. What I'm going with here is the cross-sectional area determines the velocity or blood flow. And you can see, okay, lower it's inversely proportional. Where there's low cross-sectional area, there's a high flow of blood. And where there's a large cross-sectional area, where we see in the capillaries, the flow of blood is much slower, the velocity. And this makes sense because where are we getting our exchange? All right, we want to flow the blood out the large arteries out to the tissue, but once we get to the tissue, what do we want to do? At the capillary beds, that's where we're getting the diffusion. So we want to slow down the blood so we can diffuse the things out that we need to diffuse out, and we can diffuse the things into the blood, like the waste materials and CO2. And then once we get into the bigger veins, the velocity picks up. But you can see velocity is much lower in the veins than in the arteries, because where is the pressure greatest? Pressure is greatest in the arteries compared to the veins, but the takeaway here is that the cross-sectional area is inversely related to 
the velocity of blood flow. More cross-sectional area, slower the blood flow, lower cross-sectional area, the greater velocity of blood flow. This makes sense because of what the functions are of these different vessels. Right, and you can see these pressure differences across the systemic circulation. Here's kind of those larger arteries going down the smaller, right? Cross-sectional area is getting greater as we get to the capillaries. Cross-sectional area gets greater. Pressure is decreasing. So now let's get into the, basically the meat of this and how we're going to regulate blood pressure. Okay, the heart's there, the heart creates the pumping action to force the blood out. We're going to see there's a combination of the heart, the blood volume, and the vessels are else are going to be controlling or helping to regulate our blood pressure. We need to have enough pressure to be able to get the blood out to the tissues, get the blood against gravity up to the brain. Um, but we also don't want to have too high a pressure because if we have too high a pressure, we have these nice little delicate uh, vessels in the brain and so forth where it can burst them. So we need to keep that blood pressure within a homeostatic range. And there's going to be three main factors that are coming into play to affect this. Okay, we have our cardiac output, which we already have gone over. We've seen it's controlled by the stroke volume and the heart rate, right? We've done the factors that have controlled this. Total peripheral resistance, TPR, right? This has to do with what is the resistance out there, and that is controlled by basically the arterioles, those little vessels with the smooth muscle and the vasoconstriction and vasodilation, right? Total meaning all of the arterioles throughout the body. All right, if I have more vasoconstricting than vasodilating, or vasodilating, if I have more constricting, I'm going to increase the resistance. There's going to be more resistance against the heart, and more resistance creates greater pressure. Okay, whereas if I have vasodilation, there's less resistance that will decrease the pressure. So depending on how much is taking place, vasodilation decreasing blood pressure, vasoconstriction would increase it. And then the other factor is blood volume, right? We're going to see these two factors are chiefly controlled by either epinephrine or by the nervous system. So they can be regulated fairly rapidly. We can get rapid control by using cardiac output, by affecting the heart, or by affecting the vasoconstriction or vasodilation. The factor that is a bit slower and hormonally controlled for the most part is blood volume. Okay, but it's going to be a regulation of these three factors that gets our blood pressure regulated, keeps us in this homeostatic range. Okay. Again, these are quickly and a more slower response. Okay. This we've seen. This was one of our examples we used at the beginning of the year in baroreceptor reflex. Okay. Baroreceptor, there are those receptors on those blood vessels in the carotid artery, the branch with the carotid branch or at the aortic arch we have these stretch receptors these baroreceptors that respond to stretch okay when blood pressure is high it's going to put more stretch and what happens to the firing rate of those receptors it increases right and these is this is the neuron these receptors are going to send the information to the cardiac regulation areas and basically the medulla and then we can get a response to help 
maintain this because we want to keep our blood pressure within this homeostatic range. We don't want to be sitting up here this high 180. We want to keep it within this homeostatic range. All right, and so there is the relay. We got the baroreceptors again here in the carotid. That's helping, hey, what is the blood pressure going up to the brain? And we have the receptors here in the aortic arch, baroreceptors, and they send that information to the medulla. Okay, how can we control blood pressure? One factor is we can control it via affecting the rate of the heart, right? We can control blood pressure by affecting our cardiac output. We can control the rate here. We can also control the contractility through the sympathetic and not shown here, but we can control the total peripheral resistance. We can control the vasoconstriction or vasodilation throughout the body to help regulate this blood pressure. And depending on what is taking place, if the baroreceptors are sending in, hey, blood pressure is low, we're gonna increase the activity here at the heart. And what might we do with the total peripheral resistance? And you know, we can increase constriction and that would also bring blood pressure up. On the opposite end, if blood pressure was signaling high, then we would lower the heart rate, lower the contractility, and what might we do to total peripheral resistance? We would cause vasodilation, because vasodilation would help us bring down blood pressure. So that is, we can get this nice quick response with the baroreceptor reflex to help get this very fine tuning very quickly because we are using the nervous system here. Okay, here's the response. What do we have? We started off with low venous return, low endostolic, low stroke volume, low cardiac output, and therefore we ended up with lower blood pressure. That's the stimulus, right? Here's our reflex loop. Bar receptors. Send, hey, low blood pressure to the medulla. And what's the medulla? The medulla is going to activate the sympathetic because we need to bring up blood pressure. So we're going to bring up cardiac rate. That increases cardiac output. Also, the sympathetic can increase contractility. Also, increasing both those factors would increase cardiac output. And then we can also affect the arterioles, the TPR. And how do we do that? We vasoconstrict the arterioles. That will bring up the peripheral resistance and all these factors would bring up the blood pressure. As the blood pressure climbs back into normal range, we're gonna shut this. The baroreceptors are gonna sense, hey, blood pressure is back in normal range and we can shut down this sympathetic input or slow it down so we don't get the blood pressure going too high. We get our negative feedback. Okay. And what the baroreceptors are gonna be more sensitive to decrease rather than increase in blood pressure. So there's where we get that hypertension. We're not signaling a lot. So low blood pressure, because low blood pressure would mean hey, we had not enough pressure to supply blood to the tissues. That's a problem. We're higher blood pressure, we're getting pressure, so we're able to supply the tissue. The problem is, is if it gets too high, you get those bursting of those vessels, okay? But the arrangement of the baroreceptors is to be very sensitive to changes in lower blood pressure than changes in higher blood pressure. So that other factor, that total peripheral resistance, okay, and that's controlled by the vasoconstriction and vasodilation of the blood vessels, okay? And so this is where we got this tutoring effect. If we affect one 
factor in blood pressure, there's got to be a comparable change in another to make sure the blood pressure doesn't get too high or too low. We've seen with um, right here, when we go from rest to exercise, what happens to our cardiac output? Our cardiac output goes up fourfold. If we change nothing in our total peripheral resistance, what would happen to our blood pressure? Our blood pressure would skyrocket. Okay? So, hey, cardiac output's going up. Remember, cardiac output times total peripheral resistance equals our blood pressure. And so what would happen? What would we need to do if our blood pressure or our cardiac output is going up extremely high? We have to drastically decrease the total peripheral resistance. And how do we do that? We do a massive dilation. We do our arterioles that supply our skeletal muscles are going to be dilated so they can supply the blood to the muscles, but it also helps relieve the blood pressure. Because if there are no changes made in TPR, when our cardiac output goes up this, we're going to have this extreme hypertensive crisis. This blood pressure is going to go extremely high. Okay, so here is where you got to understand the concepts of what's taking place so you understand how the factors must change. Okay, but changing one, you got to get a comparable or an opposite change in the other. So blood pressure doesn't go too high or too low. And here is where that control for TPR is taking place. All right, we get our vasoconstriction. Here's our arterioles. We can vasoconstrict them to increase resistance, increase TPR, and therefore increasing blood pressure. Or we can vasodilate. A lot more blood through, vasodilation decreases the resistance and therefore decreases blood pressure. All right, the slower factor, we can modify cardiac output, we can modify the vasodilation, we can modify TPR very rapidly via using the nervous system. Now blood volume. Blood volume, okay, again blood volume goes up, blood pressure will go up. Blood volume goes down, blood pressure will go down. Okay. Think about it in a sense of say if you drink a ton of water, water's getting into your bloodstream. Okay, that water gets absorbed in the bloodstream, your blood volume goes up. What usually happens when you drink a ton of water. You tend to go to the bathroom more because what do we have to do? Blood volume is going up. We decrease the blood volume by excreting it in the urine. So we're managing that factor so blood volume doesn't go up too high and our blood pressure doesn't go up too high. Okay, that's one example. But by decreasing blood volume, we decrease blood volume, blood pressure by increasing blood volume we can increase blood, blood pressure. But again, this is hormonally regulated and therefore it is not as quickly adjusted. It is a much more slower adjustment by adjusting the blood volume. All right, and how is this regulated? We got our ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone, along with, we'll see our aldosterone, are gonna help regulate our blood volume. They regulate water reabsorption, okay? Reabsorption of water, if I reabsorb it, I'm bringing it back in the body, back into the blood. If I don't reabsorb it, I'm excreting it in the urine, right? So when would we want ADH high? We would want it when blood volume is low. We wanna reabsorb, okay? so. Blood pressure is high. We want to decrease blood volume. How can we decrease blood volume? Is reabsorb less water. ADH causes reabsorption. We want to do less of it, so we want 
ADH secretion to be low. Now, if blood pressure is low, okay, we want to increase blood pressure. How can we increase blood pressure? We can increase blood volume by reabsorbing more water back at the kidneys. And how do we do that? One of the factors is we can use ADH. Okay, to reabsorb more ADH, more water reabsorption, more water reabsorbed back into the blood. I increase my blood volume, and therefore I increase my blood pressure. Okay, this is one hormone. We're going to see aldosterone is going to come into play also. Okay, and that is aldosterone. Okay. Released in response to low blood, blood, uh, low blood volume and low blood pressure. It causes reabsorption of salt. This is where that osmosis comes into play. If you remember, what is our most physiological affected um, non-penetrating solute? NaCl, right? So if I reabsorb sodium, what do you think also follows my sodium if I reabsorb it? It's going to be the water. So aldosterone's effects are to reabsorb salt, but its indirect effect is it also reabsorbs the water. And if I reabsorb water, what happens to my blood volume? It goes up. Okay, so when blood pressure is low, I want aldosterone around because that's going to help increase my blood pressure. All right, and we got this ugly ugly mess to go through not a mess but it is a long drawn out so there's that dehydrate we get that decrease in blood volume decrease in blood pressure okay you have cells just agglomeral cells on the kidneys that respond to this low blood pressure and they have this hormone redden. Okay, they secrete redden in response to the low blood pressure. Okay, your liver, not in response to low blood pressure, it just secretes angiotensinogen. This is an inactive molecule, so we can have it in the blood and nothing's going to take place because it is inactive. But we need to have it out there because we need to have it out there because once renin is released, the renin cleaves the angiotensinogen that the liver has put out into the blood and cleaves it into angiotensin 1. All right, but this doesn't take place unless renin is there. And when's renin there? Renin is there when there is a decrease in blood pressure. The cells will release renin. On your lungs, you have ACE, angiotensinin, angiotensinin, angiotensin converting enzyme. That's ACE. This is actually the molecule in which coronavirus was getting access to our lung cells because through this ACE receptor here that has this converting enzyme that's going to convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Now we're going to start getting into the effects of blood pressure. Angiotensin 2, you can say angio Right, blood vessel tensin tense, it's going to cause vasoconstriction on the arterioles. Right? What set, what gave us this angiotensin 2? It was the release of renin due to low blood pressure. So the stimulus was low blood pressure. Now angiotensin 2 is causing vasoconstriction. That's going to bring blood pressure up. Right, we're increasing, increasing TPR. That's going to increase blood pressure, which we want to do since our original stimulus was decreasing blood pressure. 
Also, the adrenal cortex is a site for angiotensin and 2 is going to cause the release of aldosterone. And what do we say aldosterone does? Aldosterone increases sodium reabsorption. And in turn, what follows sodium is water. And what's that going to do to our blood volume? It's going to increase it. And what does increased blood volume to? It increases blood pressure. Okay, so this is the RAS system, right? The renin angiotensin aldosterone system, RAS. Okay, it evolved, it is activated with low blood pressure. By the beginning step is the release of that renin. Right, so you should be able to recognize this pathway, be able to describe it, give me the actions at the end, and why all this is taking place. Okay, but this is one way we regulate blood volume. You see how this is a slower process than, say, regulating it through vasoconstriction, vasodilation of the arterials, and also affecting the cardiac output. Okay, this is a slower effect but it will be a longer effect too because it's hormonal. It has a longer action. Some other hormones involved in regulation of blood volume. We have atrial natriatic peptide. And what happens is, let's say there is increased blood volume. That means increased venous return we saw increased venous return causes more stretch. It'll cause more stretch on the atrium. And this is where the ANP, atrial natriotic peptide, gets released by the cells of the left atrium. Okay, what was our cue? Increased blood volume, which also would mean increased BP, right? So increased stretch. And so what would we want to do? Would we want to decrease blood volume or increase blood volume? We would want to decrease it. And the ANP acts on the kidneys to increase urine volume. If I increase urine volume, I'm pulling more water out of the blood, and therefore my blood volume is decreasing. Right? And now what's happening is that's decreasing blood pressure, and there'll be less venous return, and we get our negative feedback. So those are the factors regulating blood pressure. Let's look at actually measuring blood pressure and the different factors or the different blood pressures we're looking at because when we go to the doctor what do we get? We get two numbers. So let's look at um, how this blood pressure is measured here right so when the ventricles contract they push blood out into the arteries if you remember those blood is has they are elastic the blood vessels right outside the this is the left ventricle here they are elastic they expand when the blood is pushed out right you can see here was the vessel before when blood Ventricles contract, stretch the vessels, and then the vessels will are elastic, and they will bounce back. And as they return to their normal structure, they push the blood back or further down the arteries. Okay. So that is what the blood blood pressure is creating this effect, so we can move the blood through the system. Okay. There's the elastic recoil, and so it moves like in this wave, like this. As this elastic recoils, it pushes the blood here, stretches this next region, the next region recoils, and so we get this wave like movement of blood through these elastic arteries, help propelling the blood forward.
And so we can measure this. We can get a measurement of the stretch or the pressure put on these vessels, right? We do that using a sphygmomanometer and a stethoscope. And if we were in lab, we would be doing this. We would be measuring our blood pressure manually. And so what you have, because remember there's pressure exerted on the walls. If we push pressure on it, we can collapse this vessel, this artery. And so when we put the cuff on, all right, we have the sphygmometer with the cuff, the pressure cuff along with the pressure gauge, and it's connected to the bulb. The bulb allows us to pump up the cuff to put enough pressure to close off the vessel, close off the artery, the brachial artery. And what I'm going to do is there's a little knob and I can let the air out slowly and that will decrease the pressure. So as I let the air out slowly, I'm going to be watching the pressure gauge as well as listening on the stethoscope. So I need to listen on the stethoscope when I'm releasing the pressure from the cuff. Okay, but I do have to get enough pressure to completely occlude, completely close off the artery, otherwise this won't work. And we'll see why here. Because okay. what happens is here is I'm pumping up my cuff. I need to get above 120. That's if I don't have high blood pressure, but if I so pump it up to say 160, that's going to ultimately completely occlude the vessel. Why I'm listening is when the vessel is closed, there will be no sounds. But what happens is when I gently open up the vessel, you can see the blood flow. The blood flow usually flows in a, called a laminar fashion and it flows straight through. That doesn't make a sound, but when the vessel is still partly occluded, the blood is going to be in this turbulent, you can see zigzags here, this turbulent flow, and the turbulent flow will give us off what's called Kronikoff sounds, kind of these thumping sounds. So when my pressure cuff is above systolic pressure, okay, it's completely occluded, there's no sound, and then as I gently release the pressure and the vessel's becoming unoccluded, it's still occluded, but not completely. We're going to have turbulent sounds. And then when the vessel is completely open again, you can see the flow is laminar. All right. And there will be no sounds. The Krotikoff sounds are happening due to this turbulent blood flow when the vessel is partly occluded. Okay. And we measure, we measure, we have two pressure values that we get. Because remember the blood, we got the arteries here. We have the arteries when blood, the ventricles are contracting in systole, right? Systole is contraction. When the ventricles are in systole, they are pushing blood into the vessel and that's going to cause more stretch, more pressure on the walls. And so there will be a higher value. That is your systolic blood pressure. Okay, that should be the higher number. Right? When you go to the doctor, usually somewhere maybe around 120 over 80. Okay, the higher number is the systolic because that is the pressure on the walls when the blood is being pushed into the vessels. All right, the lower number, the diastolic, is when the ventricle is in diastole. It is relaxed. There's no blood being pushed in. That is when the pressure on the walls will be 
less because there's no blood being actively pumped into the vessel. So those are the two values we're going to get. And so when we pump up the cuff, we need to get the cuff above systolic. Right? Above our systolic value. And when we get it above systolic, we're going to be completely occluding the vessel. The vessel is going to be shut off. There's no sounds being made, right? The only sounds, the time we get Karotikov sounds, is when the vessel is partly open. And then when it's fully open, again, we get laminar flow and there is no more sound, right? And so when are those sounds going to take place? When I, the higher pressure, when I release the cuff pressure and it just gets below systolic pressure, the vessel is going to start opening. When the vessel starts opening, we get turbulent flow. And so when I first hear Rodakoff sounds, that is my systolic blood pressure. And you see as I, I'm lowering the cuff pressure, as I lower the cuff pressure, the vessel is still occluded. It will be occluded until I get below my diastolic pressure. All right, so from the range from systolic to diastolic, my vessel is still partly occluded and the, the blood is running turbulently in the turbulent flow. So all through here, I will get Karotikoff sounds until I reach just below diastolic and I lose the sound. When I'm looking at the sphygmometer, when I lose the sound on my stethoscope, that's when I mark off what the pressure is for my diastolic. Okay, so first sound signifies systolic blood pressure. The loss of the sound signifies the diastolic blood pressure has to do with the flow. After this, the vessel is open and I'm back to laminar flow. And the laminar flow doesn't send off those Karotikoff sounds. It's just the turbulent flow that is happening in these partially occluded blood vessel. Okay, so that is how I measure my blood pressure. Okay. The systolic is up here, the high end. And diastolic is on the low end. And you can see as we move through the vessels, the pressure decreases as well as what we call the pulse pressure. There is a pressure difference between systolic and diastolic called the pulse pressure. So again, pulse pressure is systolic minus diastolic. It is the difference between the two. And you can see as we move further away from the heart, okay, pressure decreases as well as we lose a difference in systolic and diastolic as we move across back towards the heart. Now pulse pressure, going back to pulse pressure because we're going to use this to determine a factor called MAP, our mean arterial pressure, but our pulse pressure is our systolic minus our diastolic. So let's say we had 120 over 80, it would be 120 minus 80, so our pulse pressure would, in this case, equal 40. Right, And this is going to allow us to calculate what we call our mean arterial pressure, the average pressure in our arteries. And we're going to see it's not systolic plus diastolic divided by 2. We're going to see that it is actually diastolic pressure plus one-third of the pulse pressure, one-third of the difference 
between systolic and diastolic. And why is this? The reason for this is because our mean pressure, we spend more time in diastole. So two thirds of our mean arterial pressure is due to diastolic because we spend twice as much time in diastolic as we do in the region up here in the systolic. Okay, so it's not systolic plus diastolic divided by two. It is diastolic blood pressure plus one third of the pulse pressure. Right, that gives you your mean arterial pressure. Okay, what if we had 120 over 80? So now we have our diastolic at 80 plus one third what do we calculate our pulse pressure out to be right 80 120 minus 80 40 and so roughly we would have 93.3 would be our map our mean arterial pressure this is an important measurement because we need to keep this within a above a certain range to make sure we are supplying the tissue with enough nutrients, enough oxygen. We have to have a certain amount of mean arterial pressure to make sure we are able to supply the blood out to all the tissue. Okay. Now let's look at some Abnormal blood pressure, okay, we could have hypotension where blood pressure falls too low. This is important, or this is, remember our baroreceptors are very responsive to changes in low pressure compared, to, or low blood pressure compared to high blood pressure, because we got to make sure we have enough pressure. If hypotension, we get too low in blood pressure, we won't be able to get force the blood out to the tissues and that's going to cut off oxygen supply Okay, one of those is one of the main regions to be affected is your brain because your brain if you're standing up you have to go against gravity so you have to create greater pressure to get to the brain than you do say to your feet and so you get dizzy or fainting spell when you get low blood pressure because you're getting less oxygen to that sensitive brain up there Okay, hypertension, where it's chronically elevated. Okay, this is where we get into the factor of we can get strokes, those ruptures of those arteries, okay, bleed out to the tissue. Problem with this is it is basically silent. We don't have, unless it's affecting, say, our heart and giving us heart, you know, pain, hypertension is basically silent. We don't have, hey, oh, I'm feeling the hypertension. It's what we call the silent killer because many times we can have the high blood pressure and have no, unless we're taking our blood pressure, we have no idea that we have this low blood or high blood pressure. Okay. You can imagine high blood pressure. There's going to be more resistance. That's going to create more afterload. It's going to make the heart work harder. So yeah. With high blood pressure, our heart's constantly having to work at a higher load. We can also damage those little nice delicate vessels if it gets too high. It also has an effect on arthrosclerosis, developing in plaques in the vessels. Okay, you see how to treat. All right, if it's pre hypertension, you know, between 120 and 140, it may ask you to slow down your smoking and alcohol intake if you're doing that. Reduce your weight, exercise, low salt, because remember salt will cause more blood volume. So if you have less salt, lower blood volume, lower blood pressure. Okay, if that doesn't work, then you're on to 
these blood pressure medicines. We're going to see many of these affect the kidneys. They're going to affect water reabsorption. If we affect water reabsorption or say angiotensin, which causes that vasoconstriction and that aldosterone, okay, we affect bring down blood volume, we can bring down blood pressure. So many of the drugs work on the kidneys, causing less water reabsorption. We get more water into or more urine volume. That means we're bringing water out of the blood volume and therefore we can decrease blood pressure. So we'll get into more of these and their effects of these drugs when we get into the urinary system. We'll look specifically on where they are operating. 